Hello and welcome to another episode of the We Have a Meeting podcast. Today is a, a bit of a different episode, as you, as you might be able to see. We've got a couple of guests and today is a battle of the mind. So just to give some context to the, the listeners, um, if you've recently been listening to the podcast, we recently sat down with Corey Bray, so he's a founder of Coach CRM. When we publicised the episode, one of Corey's viewpoints may have ruffled a few feathers and uh, caused a bit of controversy. So we thought, why not bring both parties to the podcast to debate the subject itself? So in the blue corner, all the way from Texas, it's Corey Bray. <coughs> and in the red corner from Gillingham, England, it's the sales trainer trainer, Chris James. The topic they'll be discussing today is salespeople should be put on the phone day one or day two. So we're going to be talking about the onboarding process, the ramp up time for SDRs. Um, and me and Zach Thompson, we're just here to poke the fire. Um, so I will chuck it over to Corey first and, and see when we had that initial conversation. Corey, your thoughts, day one, day two. What, what, what did you mean exactly? Well, salespeople need to get put on the phone day one or day two. Otherwise, they go into this mode where they become professional students. And I'll give the real world anecdote and then the psychological framework to support this. So the whole Sorry, idea is- Sorry, before we carry on, I don't know anything about Corey. So could you introduce yourself? Tell me how much experience you've got in onboarding, what qualifications you've got in education, oh. and go from there. We're doing resumes? Because... So, so, I just so, so is the, is the idea that- so we get to know who you are and you know where you're coming from. I've well, read curious... your books. Can the idea stand on so their I'm, own or does it have to be supported by a college degree? Well, that's what we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Moderators, well, I mean, what say you? I, I feel like you've got an opinion. I, I don't know if we need to. Yeah, I don't know that I need to share my, I mean, I have an Ivy League education. I graduated from Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. I published a book called Hiring, Onboarding, and Ramping Salespeople. I've been in sales management for 15 years. And eh, any questions? Yeah, how many onboarding uh, courses have you actually designed and developed from scratch? And how designed. many of them have you actually taken? Yeah, de designed and developed from scratch. How many onboarding courses? How many of you? You're, you're, you're throwing out numbers. Give me yours, yours first. I'll back up with mine. Designed and developed, probably 15. And I've probably oh, ran over 200 you, onboarding experiences. I've done 15 in the last two years. Oh, that's very good. We're, yeah. We're no, I mean, we. I, I'm an owner of a sales consulting firm called Close Loop, and mm -hmm. I wrote the book Hiring, Onboarding, and Ramping Salespeople after having divine, designed, I don't know, 30 or 40 of those. Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Okay, so educational. Yeah. Uh, some of the things I've been hearing about you, well, what you've said is that... Uh, well, let Chris, Chris, let's let's give Corey an opportunity to... Yeah, are we, to doing, what are, are we doing a character audit here, or what are, we, are we talking about a topic? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really clear what we're doing here, boys. Okay, go for it. Sorry, I, well, I, I just I, wanted I, to I, introduce I myself right. so I could yeah, give sure. people an idea of where I'm coming from. Well, let's, well, why, why don't we talk about the point, and then we can... And then we can I thought we were talking about the point here, not doing a resume. It's not entertaining to the audience to sit here and listen to people's resumes. That's the... I mean, I host a podcast, too, and... You know, when you listen to Joe Rogan experience, when you listen to Lex Friedman, they always start off with a hard hitting question. And that's what entertains the audience. They come in here, they want to see something that's, that's of substance. They don't listen to 10 minutes of backstory. I think that, you know, I've written eight books and what I, what I did before I wrote my first book is I went on to Amazon and I said, all right guys, what are all the negative reviews for business books? What are all the things that really turn people off? They get those one star reviews, they get those two star reviews. And what I observed over that exercise was that people that lead up with a lot of backstory and history and monologue, I'm not going to name the books, but there's some sales books out there that have 50 pages of here's, you know, in the beginning, there was the heavens and the earth and the salesperson. <laughs> and then you get to the, the actual point, page 60, and it's just not any entertaining to the audience. So I'll let you guys tell us how, you're going, how you want to run this. I just came to have a debate think, on a topic, not to I, I you know, think let's go back give to people the my same personal question. history. Yeah, let, let's go back to the same question. So in terms of that quicker ramp up let's get them doing the job on on day one day two what what were your what did you mean by that well what i mean by that is that many sales teams not all of them but the vast majority of sales teams especially in the u.s again, again you guys can enlighten me about what it looks like um in the united kingdom i've only worked with i don't know 20 or 30 uh organizations in the european theater so my experience isn't as vast over there we're typically hiring people who have college degrees we're typically hiring people who are smart 
And what happens is when you hire somebody that has been a student from kindergarten through 12 grades through college, that's 17 years of school. And when you bring them into an organization where they're doing something that is different than what they were trained in school, schools are largely designed to create factory workers. They've got a structured curriculum. They've got a structured day. They've got a bell. They've got rules. They've got a person at the front of the room that's doing this top-down thing. When you go into a sales organization, that's necessarily the culture that you that you have. You know, you you get in there, and you're interrupting patterns as you're initially prospecting. You're answering questions with questions. You're not being a servant to the prospect. You're working through a discovery process that then leads to um, disqualification or, or or business being done. So it's different set of activities than what you'd observe in school. It's not about what you know. You know, the salespeople that go to business meetings and just answer prospect questions, they're not successful. That's not the job. The job isn't to be a customer service rep and somebody that just knows a lot of things. So what needs to happen is a shift in the behavior that somebody demonstrates as they're in that, that sales role. Now, if you're talking about somebody that's had sales experience or not had sales experience, it doesn't matter. Here's, what, here's my point. If you take somebody in an onboarding program and you put them in a multi-week or multi-month training program, what you're doing is you're shifting them from doing the activity of being a salesperson to that mindset of being a professional student. And you've got this, the, the academic framework that supports this is this Dunning-Kruger effect. So confidence decreases as knowledge increases. And that's what we see with Dunning-Kruger. So if somebody starts a job, in their first day or two, their confidence is high. This is the job that I chose. I only chose one. Can't have two jobs. If you're in sales, you got one job. You work for a company and you're pumped about that. You're super pumped as Travis Kalanick says. You go into that organization and the more you learn, the more intimidated you get. Oh, this target market's a little more complicated than I thought. Oh, these personas, I haven't actually met them. Let me dig a little bit deeper into them. Ooh, this competition sounds scary and it seems like product marketing he doesn't even know them inside and out. Oh man, there's so many objections. I got to memorize these. And what if I get them wrong? And all of these different things. And so there's all of this information you've got to absorb. But in, at the end of the day, what you really need to do is put some points on the board and show some results. But the salesperson has to have confidence to be able to do that. They've got to have confidence over the course of time that they're able to go in there and execute and, and show some results. So my point is not that you put somebody into a quota carrying role and that you give them their full quota with the best accounts and have them run a sales process end to end day one. My point is you get them to start doing some sort of activity that is tied to sales that can add value to the organization that's run in parallel with the rest of their onboarding program. It could be as simple as putting them on the phone and inviting them to a webinar, calling one persona, mentioning one pain point that might exist for them to want to come to that webinar. And you're starting the flywheel of them being able to be successful in their job. And you're going to build upon that over time. And then the last thing I'll say, and I'll hand it over to Chris for his response, is that one of the biggest things that we're trying to do with sales training and onboarding and all of these things is to equip people with knowledge, sure. Equip people with skill, equip people with mindset. But then we need to bridge that gap from them knowing things to them doing things. And if you don't bridge the gap from knowing to doing, you're gonna have people fall flat on their face. And for anybody listening to this that has folks that came in and they seem like they know the business and they seem like they were getting it and then they just never performed, it's very likely that that bridge from knowing to doing was never crossed. Chris, you said he's. He, you said online. I think the first comment you put was "lol," like you put like laughing out loud, and then you obviously said um, in the podcast earlier, like he's barking up the wrong tree. What? Why? Talk me through your thoughts. Well, what Corey's talking about is something we call "fail fast, learn quickly." Uh, the emphasis is on learning quickly uh, rather than failing. Of course, obviously, it'd be insane to you know seek out failure. I but never fail used fast, failure learn... once. I never supported failure. I didn't say anything about failure. But you're setting them up to fail. But we can look at that. How am I setting fail up to fail? If you call somebody for a web, I said call somebody for a webinar with one one person, one pain point. You can't learn that in an hour. You shouldn't be in a in a job. Yeah, um, I I got this from uh, putting people on the phones from day one or two. So uh, I also read part of your book where you said they go on the phones themselves. So maybe we need to clear this up because I thought this was all about putting new to sales people out of university on who are doing advanced uh, transactional sales on the phones in day one or two. That's what I got from this. And to do that, your theory comes from what we call fail fast, learn quickly, which comes, oops, my dog comes from the lean. Ah. 
pioneered by a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, Eric Ries. And of course, it's mainly practiced in the US in the East Coast, and my dog's still going. So he, he wrote a book which summarizes exactly what I'm saying. Up. Kaya, come here. Kia, what are you like? So basically, in his book, The Lean Startup, today's entrepreneurs use continuous innovation to create radically successful business. It's a kind of Bible for people like yourself who went to Entrepreneur University. It applies to startup entrepreneurs and corporate executives who kind of have to penetrate the fog of uncertainty when building new technologies, products and services, for example. It's about tweaking your products and services in line with customers' needs, you know, what works, what doesn't. But it's absolutely nothing to do with accelerated learning principles or how we teach people, how people learn. So, you know, you're saying this, that people should go on the phone since day one. So, and I read your book, The Sales Enablement Playbook. I read the one about ramping up and uh, The Sales Enablement. I've read all three over the weekend. The thing I'd like to ask is what scientific research do you have to back up your claims that this works? What proof do you have? I've done it for years and my co-founder has done it since 2008. We've done it both ways. We've done it your way. We've done it my way. And I'll, I'll comment on Eric Ries. I mean, I wouldn't say that that's the Bible. I would say that Steve Blank's the Startup Owner Manual, who was Eric Ries' mentor, that book's three times longer. It's much more in depth. Startup, uh, the Lean Startup's a derivative work of Steve Blank's work, summary. And, but that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is, I mean, if we're talking about psychological frameworks, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I'm sure you're familiar with, sir. Yep. People's confidence decreases over time as the knowledge increases. And that's, that's the theoretical underpinning here, is that if you oh, gosh, continuously yeah. equip people with more and more knowledge, they're going to have a drop in confidence. Um, stop a minute. I think he agrees with me. For um, I, I like we like live entertainment. We said there was going to be no edit. So um, for anybody listening right now, uh, obviously it's um, the 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 two. I think mine and Zach's job today is not to to get involved. We probably have our own viewpoints, and me and Zach could probably argue till we're blue in the face. Um, I guess Chris, with with the dog being out the room, back now. It, there was a point earlier where you you weren't too. It sounded like you weren't too sure about like what was actually being debated or it sounded like you might be on the, the same pages a little bit so you you categorical you categorically disagree that, that with the confidence coming into an organization using that confidence to kind of get on the phones day one you 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 from the points that Corey said so far you categorically disagree or is there some middle ground which, which i'm misunderstanding no i categorically okay. disagree uh, you disagree totally that people's disagree. confidence decreases as they begin to accumulate knowledge inside an organization? No, I think we need to build confidence. We build confidence before we put them on the phones. Have put them on the phones has a very negative effect. Failure, Are you familiar with the Dunning-Kruger model? Doing. Sorry? Are you familiar with the Dunning-Kruger model? Probably not, no. You said it earlier on, I thought I was, but I, I, I'm not. But I'm, I'm no, go, go, go for it. Tell me what the model says. Well, let me, let me, let me throw a screenshot of it. Or how do you share screen on this guys? I don't know. Can one of you guys throw it up on the screen? Just Google it, Dunning-Kruger. Start up on the screen. I mean, this is the, you know, you'd mentioned in the LinkedIn comments, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how that applies and I could, I could share any thoughts there. Well, uh, Mas Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs is basically what somebody needs to feel confident in a job, especially when they start. Uh, basically, what, what are the physiological needs, what are the safety needs, love and belonging needs, the self-esteem and the self-actualization needs. What do people really need to be confident when they start in a job? So really, you want to know where you're going. There's little things like that. You know, you want to know that uh, you're not going to be set up to fail, for example. You know you're going to make friends there. You know you're going to be listened to. You're going to be able to... to make friendships, you're going to build confidence, you're going to have respect from people, those kind of things. They're all things that people need in jobs. So how, how long in your mind does it take to learn a call script for if you're calling one persona? 
for a salesperson. How long does it take to learn? Right, now let's, let's look at that in itself, right? A call sure. script. So with whose call script are we learning? The one that works. Whose call script? One that works. So it could be Sam's, could be Fred's, could be anybody's, yeah? Well, it could be literally anyone's. It could be Jack's, sure. hey, this is a sales call, you may hate me, but you know, it might be Josh Braun's way, it might be someone else's way. But generally what I find in companies is there is one major seller, you know, very confident and uh, everyone kind of looks up to this person. They kind of follow that script. You know, it, it could be, let's call him Phil. Phil's, you know, a social animal. He likes partying. He's a, he's a lad. You know, he was the, the, football, the football team captain. You know, he knows how to play hard. Has a sniff every now and then, likes to drink. On Monday... Susan starts. Susan studied zoology at East Sussex University. Her whole life, she wanted to work with animals. She wanted to go to Thailand and work in uh, animal rescue centres. She wanted to go to Malaysia, work with animals in Malaysia. After a year and a half, she found out that she couldn't do that. So like many people, I don't know about you, Jack, if you were born into sales. I don't know about you, Zach, if you were born into sales. Or you, Corey, but she fell into sales. So what we're saying is this girl, who is completely the opposite to uh, this guy, is going to copy his script. Ah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But she gets on the phone, this girl, and uh, she has all these negative thoughts in herself. You know, uh, she's reading this script and it doesn't sound right. It's not her. She knows she's got to do this right. This is her first day. She's got to impress people. She needs that flat. She's, oh, I, I, I've never done this before. I need help. I'm anxious. She's slow on the call. She's a bit awkward. You know, she's, uh, you can hear her brain ticking over. You hear the fear. She's apologizing to the customer. As she gets more and more nervous and drawn into the call, she's using sentence fillers. She is losing it now. It's gone too far. She only has the capacity to do maybe six or seven sentences, but now the customer's interacted with her. She's nervous. She can't remember a thing about the call. And the sales manager says, well, how do you think that went? Do you think she remembered that first day, that first moment, or do you think she was shit scared? Now, I think that that is not the learning met methodology. Well, I, I think that that's it's dumb. a failure. I don't know why someone that's would do that. People. What, that put people maybe... on the phones on day one? No, that's not what you do. So put people well, on the phones on day one. It's not theirs. You're presupposing. Well, okay, so let's let's look at this, right? You're presupposing that the script is so antithetical to the person's personality that they physically couldn't deliver it. That's what it sounds like the underlying point here is. Coupled with the fact no, that you're presupposing no, it's that they they've do never it. probably read out a script before, and the script they're doing is not in line with their personality. So it's why a would you... generic script, or it's done by someone who is flavor of the month. So is a salesperson's job to create content or deliver content? Sorry, is a salesperson's job to create content, as in, in this word, in this place, the content is a script, or is it a salesperson's job to leverage things that other people have created in order to create a specific result? Meaning, book a meeting, progress the deal forward, disqualify, or close the sale. What, well, on day one? See, I, I see it slightly different to you, Corey. I see the person. I see the human being. As and there's I. a human, everyone's different. Everyone's different, and everyone has yes. different needs. Everyone, uh, some people are soft-spoken. Some people like to talk to people very laid back, very relaxed. Some people are more on your face, more confident. So yeah. what I say is what we do is we develop scripts for those personalities in action. We don't just give them a one script for all. And I think oh. if you're going to do it on day one, you're setting them up to fail because you're giving them firstly a script that they're never probably going to get through. And secondly, because it takes away all the principles of accelerated learning, of confidence, because confidence is contagious and so is lack of, con uh, lack of confidence. It can bring a whole floor down. If you set people up to fail, which you are doing, they will fail. So here's the thing. The biggest way to build confidence is for people to win.
for people to feel like they did something and they did it well. So let me just let me just walk. Let's yeah. let, let, let's say let's assume for a second that a, a work day is eight hours long. Let's just okay. So sorry, they what? Let's they worked eighteen it, hours. No, let's assume that a work day is eight hours long. The work say again. Assume the work the day work is eighteen day is hours eight, long. Uh, eight hours long. Okay, sorry. So the work day is eight hours long. Let's say there's two hours of stuff you got to do in the morning. Meetings, paperwork, whatever. Well, could we do some role plays? And let's assume for a second that we're not going out doing discovery calls to senior executives in our target market A-list accounts. Let's assume for a second that we're saying, hey, look, my goal here is to build this person's confidence by having them learn what we're doing and simultaneously execute something that's going to add value to the company while building their confidence because this is the whole reason i'm doing this is to build their confidence and i think this if you guys could pull up the dunning kruger just go, go to google images that wikipedia picture is terrible that doesn't it's not actually the image i'm looking for um pull up something google images we'll, we'll, we'll walk through this the the idea is that we're giving them something that they can get a quick win at and if i can give them a script that says hey look we're having a webinar in two weeks yeah there we go okay so we're building the confidence by giving them a little bit of knowledge here. And we see this peak here. If we don't do this, if we don't let them win, if we don't let them put some points on the board, they're going to continue to accumulate more knowledge over time and get to this cultured point down here, which other other representations of this call it the trough of disillusionment. And all of a sudden they feel like they're drowning. They're drinking from the fire hose, as they say, and they know all of these things. And what they're not doing is in a position to apply a very specific subset of what's needing to be applied. And that's why I use this example. Again, inviting people to a webinar, it's not the thing that everybody should do all the time. If you've got somebody that's got more experience that can actually get in there and do something a little more advanced, book a meeting or maybe even run an introductory discovery call, that's fine. But what I've heard is presupposition that this person's coming out of university. So giving them a five line script with a couple of responses to some objections, going in the conference room and practicing that role playing with them for 60 minutes. And once they're good at, once they're confident in the conference room, let them go rep it. Go see if they can get a couple points on the board. Because nothing, nothing will create more confidence than somebody being able to succeed day one. But don't let them try until they've demonstrated that they can do it in a role play situation. So, I totally disagree with you. I'm sorry to say that. Right, the benefits to you, you say, are add value to the company, because it's all about the company maybe. Add confidence to the person. That's if they're successful, yeah? That's if they're not re reading off this script and they don't dissolve on it. They don't on let day it out there until they do it in the role play. So they do it in the role play. You don't let them go do it until they can do it in the role play. I don't understand where the disconnect here is. So do you not? Uh, I, was, I thought it was in day one. I, I don't know how much learning has been because my experience day one is kind of, it's more about uh, building teams within teams. It's about building kind of the endowment theory that this person's going to love working for this company. That's what we set first. We set those kind of bases that uh, you're going to always be with this team. This team are going to help you. And th there's always someone here within you who's going to help you along that line when you have problems. Okay, so that's the first thing. So we bond the team together as a team. That's what I see the first morning as. Then really we're looking at uh, understanding the company a bit. Because you can't really go into a, a call on the first day without understanding a bit about the company. Maybe three value value props that the company offers, you know. Uh, sure. So you, you need to know that. So that's that's going to take you maybe, right, let's, let's say an hour, let's say five minutes, however long it's going to take. And then you're going to obviously role play that in. Yeah. And also they're going to have to introduce themselves. And whatever format you're going to use, it's going to be maybe, let's say, a soft approach introduction empathy statement then you're going to do reason for the call 30 second commercial reason for the call again link to close and then close so that's a simple structure so then they're going to have to learn that little structure somewhere and they're going to have to learn the value of those three in the uh 30 second commercial that's not a day that's not a day to learn that and then to uh be able to be confident when saying it and however much role play you play, that is a lot to get in. Why do they have to so have what, all the theory there to be able to execute on it? Can't we pick the theory up later? So then what you're saying, 
so you, one of your things you talked about, what was it, some sort of uh, fire hose? You don't want to learn too much. Info. So what you're saying is yeah, the do theory, that now the and then we'll yeah. do all the theory later. Why don't we set them up to succeed first, then put them on the phones? See, I, I, I've been looking at this quite heavily and I was trying to think, what are the benefits of a new starter? What do they get from failing on day one? Because There's that's no what here. I don't understand where your idea of failure is. Are, are you telling me? It's not me? for you. It's not for you, Corey. It's for them. You don't know how each individual perceives their performance. However much talking or however much safety net you say they can have, we are still human beings. We still have fears. We still have anxieties. Yeah. You don't control them, they do. So whatever you do, you are actually setting some of them up to fail. So what I do is I try to think, right, what are the benefits of putting people on the call? We know they're not going to be successful. They might get something out of it. Okay, so a fast learning curve is, is basically what you've said, yeah? It's a fast learning curve, you know, backed up with a rust, robust onboarding program. They should be okay. Real world experience, I thought. Yeah, they'll get real, they'll actually talk to someone and they'll get to learn a bit about how the other person feels, maybe. Resilience learning, you know, uh, hopefully they'll be able to be in that situation again and be able to deal with it. That, those are the three, those are the three. I couldn't think of any more. Add confidence, I didn't think it would. Add value to the company, I couldn't see that at all. And uh, so then I put, what are the negative effects? And I put, well, what's going to influence it? I mean, they're going to have a lack of product knowledge and they're going to have ineffective sales techniques. They're going to be out on the road there. There's going to be a negative customer experience. The customer's going to think, oh my God, what am I doing receiving this call? This person really hasn't got a Scooby-Doo of what they're doing. They're going to have low conversion rates, negative impact on brand awareness, the wasted leads, demotivation of the person. What happens if someone succeeds and the other three, four don't? How are they going to feel? Employee retention. You know, I put here, failure like all emotions and feelings, it sets off a chain of events and chemicals in your mind, yeah? If you fail, the experience like disappointment, fear and embarrassment. When we win, our brains, you know, we re release endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, whatever it is, and they motivate us. But when we fail, there are other things, coracels, stuff like that, that goes through our mind that does the opposite. And what we can find is if we do this and we fail with them, it alters their perceptions of their own abilities. They don't think they can do it from day one. Unless you put such a robust safety net in, uh, failure gives the impression you're powerless. I'm not in control of this conversation. I'm reading from a script. I'm actually powerless. Uh, fear of failure, could, uh, I mean, can, can, can I share my uh, You screen? are allowed to. Legally, if you can, I okay? don't know. But I, w I, I will allow you to do that if you can press the, if you can click the, the share screen. <laughs> what, what, while you're loading it, Chris, then, can I, can I ask? So in an dun, ideal dun, world, dun. You, you've done this. If Corey is saying that the ideal time with role plays and things like that is one to two days, what what do you think is like if you had to put a number on it? What 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 does that look like? Uh, for me personally, it would be so that'd be two days. work weeks. Yeah, go on, on the and day. coming back in on the Monday. So you've got two weeks of knowledge and learning, and then you go away for the second weekend. You come back in, and you're expected to cold call on the the Monday. It, Mm. Azek yep. Bachok. Can you see my screen? Mm. Yeah. Can you see Azek? Eh? Right. So this is a, this is an example of the way I do things. I think we've we've listened to Corey now. We'll listen to some of how I do mine. So I do a two week onboarding program, and this is the last one I did in Singapore. Uh, so I haven't been back since, and it's a Park Place Technologies. That's Azek. He hit his targets every month. He was promoted to account manager. Uh, in a record time, they all were, on August 2019. It was actually five months they were together and they were all promoted. He was at the company for one year, six months. 
We'll look at militia and, and uh, Suri called into India, hit target every month. Look at their service, 3.3 years, three years. I don't just teach people to be successful. I teach what we call the endowment, to love the company they're working for and to really buy into it. The next one is Felix. Felix only did 1.2 years, but like the others, he was successful. Elvin, another guy, successful, 1.7 years. Hit his target every month. Pingui, another one. She only did 10 months because she moved to Australia. And like every training course, we have Alex, whose visa ran out. Hey, that was, a, that was an onboarding class I did. I did it for two weeks. I built up their confidence. I gave them all the sales skills they needed to be successful. I built them up through accelerated learning principles, through assessment for learning games, and there was hardly any PowerPoint at all. So let's go back to, uh, let's have a look at another one. Meet Brandon. So Brandon was a new to sales uh, SDR. He's straight out of university. Uh, he, he worked in an environment where the SDR drove the conversation to the AE and the AE did the disco demo. At 11.15 on the first day on the phones, he booked a meeting on his first day. He went on to book five more that week. In fact, the whole, only one person, I tell a lie, one person didn't book a meeting in the first week. On the same school was Nick Alden. Nick had, was uh, actually a singer, I think. Uh, he booked seven meetings in his first week on the phone. A still a record for sales at a verity. And then we crossed the pond. I was also training George in uh, New York. So he booked three Chris, meetings to, in his first two to, days on the for phones. The, um, listeners at home, obviously, some people might be listening to this via just a podcast, Spotify. So what, what you're saying is these are all people that you've trained up and they've, they've gone through your process of two weeks. Corey, any thoughts on this so far? Up and I don't know it's relevant to the conversation. Okay, so we're looking at success. You're saying that uh, putting people on the phones from day one works. I say it doesn't. You haven't yeah. backed up any proof at all that it does work. I've just shown you seven examples, eight examples where it has worked. All we've got is your words saying, oh, I've been doing it. My, my point is not that I never said that if you wait two weeks, then people aren't going to book meetings. I never made that statement. So sure, people waited two weeks and booked meetings. That's fine. Uh, I didn't make a PowerPoint with pictures of people's faces that I worked with. To, to, that's not, the, 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 I, I, I'm truly curious <laughs> if you disagree with the principles of the Dunning-Kruger model. That's that's kind of because you, you mentioned theory. I didn't I didn't read your books. I didn't do, do research. I, I said it sounded like we we're going to do uh, academic framework. So I I found the one academic framework that I've been relying on for years, and that's it's the theory that underpins this. So does the Dunning-Kruger model hold water? No, that's the question. Well, it was for software engineers, wasn't it? The one we looked at and software engineers and more it's product specialists and sales it's for specialists. Humans, it's for human beings. Oh, well, that's, that's the example you gave. So that's the only thing I could I read. never gave a software. Was when did I give a soft fellas? Did I give a software it, engineering example? I don't fact remember that. What, at what point, Chris? I haven't said the word software engineer today. No. Well, pick up the page that you were on. What, when, when we were we looking at, at the, the Dunning Kruger? Did I read the wrong thing? Well, regardless of, yeah, yeah, yeah there's a hundred images on it was Google. Just, uh, it was I don't just have a, screen, a like graph. It did say the screen. journey of a software engineer, but I think it's. Well, pull up a different one. There's a hundred of them on there. It's, it's, it's okay. It so, okay. With, it has nothing to do with software engineers. It has to do with humans. And I think that's the, that's the whole point is that confidence decreases as knowledge increases. It's something that is supported by learning theory. It's something that I've personally observed. It's something that my coworkers, colleagues, mentors, and clients have observed. You give people more and more knowledge. They've got more things running through their heads. They're thinking about what about this? What about that? They're nervous. They're not hyper-focused. And when I'm talking about the activities to do on day one, give them something they can do. You know, I wrote about one, one comment I made in the sales enablement playbook was that 
minor league baseball players. Well, minor league baseball players, guess what they do? They play baseball. They don't shag balls in the outfield to practice that and then go catch some ground balls in the infield and practice that and then go do guys' laundry because you know they're new and all those types of things. They play baseball. you got to put people on the field. In the or fashion, junior baseball. No, they don't. They have a little stick where they put a ball on. And they put the ball on the stick and they practice. I'm talking about height. adults and... I'm talking about adults forward. in the minor leagues. I'm talking about adults in the minor okay, leagues. Okay, sorry. And we're talking about salespeople that have gone to school for 17 years. So we're not we're not T ball. I mean, I think that's the other thing is I've got to. I disagree, these... Corey. I mean, I, I watch Ronaldo practice on telly sometimes, and he stays after everyone's gone and practices free kicks. He practices, 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 and he says, "I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better, and I'm going to get better." Yes. He practices. He doesn't just do it in the game. He does it outside the game. Continually, continually. So the practice he does, he can replicate in the game. Correct. And the best I mean, way what, to figure what, out where to practice is to understand where the gaps are in the game. And you've got to get people on the field. That's the, that's the, whole, that's, that's the whole point. And I think I've brought, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm not going to change your mind. That's not my point. I don't think you're going to change adult males' minds about pretty much anything. But I just wanted to share my thoughts. That's cool. I mean, I agree with you. Success in sales is based on the foundation of the seller and the team's confidence. The constant beliefs that challenges can actually be overcome. You know, I've walked, I've walked alongside many SDRs, AEs, and the more I work with them, you know, I see that selling constantly assaults their confidence. You know, I've come to understand that confidence lies in the heart of successful performance. With, you know, I kind of, with confidence, the seller will pick up the phone and face the many demands of prospecting. Without confidence, the same person, the same sage, will withdraw back in to the personal and much safer comfort zone. Well, I so totally the, agree with what you're saying I about that. I agree confidence. with that. The theory, the, so the, the, you know, going back to theory, since we're, we're, we're hammering on that today, the, the model that, that I know that underpins that is the, um, the results continuum from cognitive behavioral therapy, where somebody takes an action and they see a result, and that result impacts their mindset, which leads them to make a decision to take an action where they see results, and that impacts their mindset. You can't change somebody's mindset by change, telling them to change their mindset. I can't tell you that the earth is flat or that religion X is the best or political party Y is the best. I can't tell you those but, things and have you change your mindset. Confidence is a choice. Confidence is not a choice. Confidence it is a is, choice. You can't choose to be confident. I can't tell you to be confident. Pick yes or no. The, the whole point of this model that I'm describing is that somebody has to take a choice to take an action. And then the confidence is, a, is something that happens as a result of that action. So if we put them in a world to succeed, if we give them something that's small enough, not go win a deal, just get them to come to a webinar. This very basic example that I keep giving, and they get them, boom, confidence. I, I disagree. I think confidence is a choice. How, how so? How can you tell? It, when when does somebody have the choice to be confident or not? Well, the journey to becoming a more complete seller obviously begins with building confidence, and then learning to maintain it through back, through setbacks. It's how you deal with it that matters. And it is a choice how you deal with things. So what is it's, the it's choice? So in a choice, you've got, you've got A and B. So like, what is what is choice A and what is choice B? I'm, I'm unclear. Well, let's let's just say you get a rejection. Sure. Okay, you get a rejection. You get, oh, I'm not interested, for example. And you don't deal with it. Now, it's up to you how you deal with that rejection. But to be confident next time, you're going to have to lead, you're going to have to read up on it or ask someone for help. So now you can overcome that objection. So now you have the confidence. So I say confidence is a choice. It's because how you actually tackle that. If you just leave it alone, then obviously I think that's your choice. I would I would say in that example, it's really up to the organization to equip the pe the person with that. Real, sorry, Jack, real quick. I think it's up to the organization to equip people with that because if you've got a new person coming in and you're having them do something, again. Something simple. Ask people to a webinar. There's only five or ten types of rejection you're going to get. You know what those are. So set the people up mm -hmm. for success by helping them preview. Well, here's what you might run into. Here's how you can handle. Oh, and by the way, here's the other thing with salespeople is that anybody that gets upset about rejection, the key is to preview up front. Like, look, rejection's part of the job. You're going to get rejected 80% of the time. And so you can't. And one, one of the things we write about the sales enable playbook is help them set negative goals. So instead of the goal being to get one yes, the goal is to get 10 no's. 
because we know based on the math, based on the prospecting math, based on the sales math, that if we can get 10 people to tell us the word no, and we're executing well, we're going to get a yes. Or maybe it's five. And oh, it depends on or you could ratio. gamify it. You could gamify it. Sure. You could get uh, two points for getting sent away along, two points for finding out someone else who's involved in the process, three points for delivering your uh, value statement. Yeah. It doesn't That's have it. to be the end goal. It mm. could be game for There's, um, there's, there's been some very assess, valid points. I think, I think it's been a very matters. interesting conversation. Sure. We've, we've spoke about a few different things from confidence. I guess closing comments on, on the show, if, if the discussion is onboarding should be one or two days versus onboarding should be 11 days. Uh, Chris, we'll go over to you. Closing comments on the show. Why is Corey wrong? Uh, I think he's setting people to fail. By putting them on the phones on day one we could have more of an adverse effect than building them with confidence and only putting them on the phones when they're ready to go on the phones. We're all different. We're all different personalities. We all learn in different ways. We all learn at different speeds. We all, we all also uh, are affected by anxiety and pressure in different ways. It doesn't make us bad salesmen because we are anxious on our first days of being on an onboarding course. We just need Corey, to set the way for them, prepare them well, and give them the chance they deserve. Set milestones for people and let them advance to the next level when they're ready. Learn the content, learn the script, role play the script. As soon as they're ready, get them on the phones. If that's day one, let it rip. Don't force them to sit in a conference room and become a professional student for another 10 days. Again, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. If y'all want to go out and do Chris's method, that's fine. That's great. And then the last thing I'd say is I don't think onboarding should be one day. I don't think it should be 10 days. I think onboarding is something that should never end technically because you've always got more product. You've got a competitive landscape shift. You've got new things that come up with prospects outside of the, the competitive landscape in the, in the broader market. You've got all of these things. We need to constantly be equipping salespeople with those. We need to constantly be assessing the retention of their knowledge, of their skill, and of their mindset. And then we need to coach the heck out of them along the way. And then we're gonna make successful people. And I think that nothing I'm saying is in the spirit of set people up for failure. Don't set them up for failure. Understand how to make them successful in very micro segments. And once they've advanced to that next level, let them go because people get bored, they get disengaged. And that's where you start seeing tenure drop off, where you start seeing people just failing to push themselves harder. Incredible. If you're Thank you, guys. People, Thank you, gentlemen. People, let them go execute and be their support and miss. You need to. Thanks, guys.